they tell you about the massive negative impacts, if they tell you that health is a human right, how you actually like disrespect that human right and you, call, you make sure that more people die of easily preventable diseases. First, so what actually causes the problem of high drug resistance? First, we think there are massive pharmaceutical interests to constantly develop things like MeToo drugs or like things that have that, that minimize side effects for like different formulations of that. And when people in developed countries have access to those types of drugs, they overuse them, right? They tell you themselves that overuse is a problem, but that's only a problem when you can adequately access those drugs. So, for example, people take antibiotics when they're unnecessary. It happens in rich countries when people can afford them. That's not a huge part. That's not a huge chunk out of their budget. We think that those sorts of problems are not ones that are solved by this motion, right? Re recognize that they do absolutely nothing to, for example, regulate pharmaceutical companies to have to prove that their new drug is like massively different. We, like we do absolutely nothing to rich countries that already comply with the whom to prevent overuse of these things. We think that the targeting of pre like precisely developing countries for a developed world problem is not going to be effective. But furthermore, if we buy their characterization, the most important thing here for it is for developing countries uh, most likely to comply with these conventions, we think that this is not going to be effective. First of all, we don't think that people like should have their lives held as ransom for their governments to comply. But we think that there are other ways to like discuss with these countries about like, about adhering to these conventions. But we don't think that the WHO should be trying to implement their own policies, which always trend towards the most enlightened, like ideal policies dealing with like healthcare systems that are rich, that are able to like, for example, like have equal and fair distribution, to have these sorts of things that don't really apply to countries that actually don't have the resources to be able to like formulate these good policies, right? So we don't think that uh, compliance is likely when, as they tell you, these are likely countries that have the least ability to restructure the budgets if it's likely that like they're in a period of massive economic development and they need to. For for example, pump their cows full of antibiotics to make sure that their agricultural industry is successful. But let me tell you about the massive health impacts and why that's likely to be extremely negative. People will literally die. As they tell you, globalization is a thing. Even <coughs> high-resistant strains of diseases are not cropping up in these places. People are flying in and, and like doing business there and bringing in these diseases. The problem is, is that they can fly back and access the, the uh, high-resistance drugs in their own countries. The people who can't access those drugs are the ones who are stuck in these countries with little mobility. So when you ban, there's often has literally no way to access legitimately these drugs, right? Why? We think that the alternative for governments, if we, uh, and I'm going to prove to you later why it's unlikely that they're going to comply, their options are to like innovate uh, themselves. And we think that a lot of these countries that have like the inability to restructure their health and agriculture budgets are not the ones that have the biggest like innovative capacity to like back engineer these disease, these drugs, right? We think that pharma, like, pharma is the industry often cited with the highest startup cost. So you need things like facilities and equipment and then those are expensive. You need things like, like you need to target brain drain so that the people who are being educated in that country don't keep leaving to take jobs with pharma companies in the US that, that pay well and make a lot of money and have like investors who pour in a billion dollars. You need to research for a really long time, oftentimes, before you find anything productive, and oftentimes a lot of these endeavors are not. So I think relying on these countries to get access to these drugs themselves is problematic, because otherwise people die. We think that if you make them do that, that comes out of their government budget for distribution of drugs and essential health services, right? We think that necessarily they're going to worsen health in their own countries because people are going to die of these diseases, right? We think this is important in developing countries especially because consumers don't like, don't really always have the purchasing power to buy from pharmaceutical companies themselves, right? So oftentimes the way that uh, governments in developing countries access expensive pharmaceuticals is that these pharmaceutical companies sell at a reduced cost to these governments, right? They will not sell at a reduced cost to these citizens. And so if the impact to this is that people like who need these drugs do not get to access them compounded with comorbidity and poor healthcare structures meaning that these people are the most vulnerable to disease in the in, in, in the biggest cause right that's extremely problematic when you deny these people antibiotics to treat something like that right we think it is an insult to human health to die from something uh, like extremely like like gutting like that but also an, an even bigger insult when you can you could have been literally cured of that because drugs exist to target it, but also we think that a black market is going to crop up, that it's going to be massively like illegitimate. So you see it's happening in South Africa. We think that this is going to drive a lot of negative market incentives for criminal activity, like smuggling drugs and reselling at massive markups, or creating dangerous and un unregulated drugs. So the majority of citizens will still be able to unaccess these like massively expensive drugs sold by like criminal organizations and die because they can't afford it. We think that's awful, especially because it's preventable. Secondly, we think that people are forced out of like desperation to take unsafe drugs that they have no way of proving will work and like waste their money on that and die anyways. And because the safe ones exist behind a bureaucratic wall, right? I'll take back.
not taking away these drugs from these communities entirely. So obviously it's still be there for those worst cases of issue of the pregnant lady you talk about, but people who don't need them in excess because they want to be taken away to add adding to the benefits of the whole community. Okay, there is a problem of people in these countries literally being able to access zero drugs at all because the problem of overusing drugs is not necessarily one that exists in these countries. I think that people in this round need to properly characterize which are the countries that are likely to be overused. The last thing I want to say is it's principally unjust and actually practically bad for the who's legitimacy to implement this. Uh, so we think about who's role is to supplement rather than impose. Recognize that if, if like OG is worried about like Purdue, like agriculture's ability to like lobby these companies, we think it's like companies like Monsanto, which literally create like death seeds in India, which only grow for a single generation because they want like Indian farmers to continually have to purchase Monsanto Monsanto seeds to be the ones with the biggest ability to influence who policy to have to, have to and, and we think inherently about the who is going to have policies that are geared towards the West because those are the member states with the most clout, right? We think that they're the, the WHO is not NATO, it's not like the IMF or something, this is not the type of institution where we like need to impose sanctions, we think that's ridiculous, we think we're dealing with countries that have like the least ability to take that kind of hit, nor do we think that this is a good enough measure or an effective measure. But we also think that this reduces WHO legitimacy, right? Because these countries that flood the conventions, like they don't flood the conventions, not because they're evil governments that want their citizens to die, it's because health and agricultural policy complements their economic policies for development and vice versa. Budget. They say that they respect sovereignty, but we don't think that's necessarily true, and they're not allowing these countries to decide their health and agricultural policies for themselves. So we think that oftentimes these countries are likely to like just completely disregard this because they deem that their economic growth in the short term is more important than compliance with the WHO. We think that's bad because the WHO does a lot of really good stuff, like taking care of health and other aspects of life, like maternal health and like tropical diseases and things like that. You reduce their legitimacy in those things. Happy to oppose. There are two clarifications I want to make at the beginning of this round. What I want to note is ask the question, how does the political change that they want actually end up happening? Because it's unclear to me how you get that political change unless you massively harm the population first, both economically and in terms of spreading a massive health crisis so that you might buy their mechanism that they get some people that are hurt so much that they want to go out and push their government for any type of change in the first place. The second characterization that I want to make is ask the question on what type of agricultural drugs these countries are buying or these countries are overusing. They identify that the problem is oftentimes that these countries have economies whose agriculturally constantly overuses these drugs in the first place. But they have to stand for the OLA ban of both agricultural and pharmaceutical drugs. Given that we give the analysis that the pharmaceutical crisis is oftentimes used by overuse of drugs within developed nations rather than developing in the very first place, but the issue is that these economies oftentimes act like oftentimes overuse these agricultural uh, overuse these antibiotics constantly. So Two things. First, their case, then ours. On theirs, is this effective? That's the main key mechanism that they want. So I want to talk about the characterization of this debate first. Which countries are likely to do this? A few problems with, uh, with their case. First of all, there's a clear mismatch in terms of who are the ones that are overusing these drugs in the very first place and who are the ones that end up having to not have the ability to have these high health regulations in the first place in the first place. So oftentimes it is the case that it is the countries in which people can overbuy and overuse these drugs in which they can use like the characterization that OG says, like buy a couple drugs if you have the sniffles. Those are the countries such as the United States and large developed nations in which doctors do overprescribe consistently. And those countries are not meeting health standards either. What I want to note here though is that it's like you can't see that legally, right? Oftentimes it's the pharmaceutical capture of these countries and the fact that these countries have the control over the WHO. So you're not likely to like ban pharmaceutical drugs from the United States. So what I want to note about this though is that there is a clear mismatch in terms of which populists are happening. So the first characterization that I gave you was key. That oftentimes it is the fact that you are constantly overusing a, a like. But, uh, antibiotics within agriculture, but then afterwards you have to ban these an antibiotics as a whole, even though these populists oftentimes need these antibiotics for to deal with these diseases 
in the very first place. Secondly though, I ask the question on whether or not these developing nations deserve to have this punishment. Because oftentimes the reason why they have these low standards is because of Western and foreign control, right? It's the control of other pharmaceutical co companies in the West. It's the control of Monsanto that constantly tells you that you have to follow their regulations or they will pull out with foreign direct investment. So not only does that deal with partially deal with their political analysis, but you also the punishing the populaces in which they are not making the correct uh, in which who are not making the decisions at all. Third of all though, there's still like very little mechanization as to why resistance happens this way, right? I just want to point that out from OG's case. They literally just assumed resistance was likely to happen. We gave you key pieces of analysis why. Uh, fourth of all though, I want you to weigh this as well, right? Because I don't think that they clearly characterized you why resistance is the number one priority on the problem that you need to fix. Because the short-term losses, and losses economically, mind you, of agricultural sectors that are just unable to compete with the West anymore, because they no longer have the ability to buy cheap antibiotics that they were dependent on, or that they were necessarily sustainable about, means that those populaces die from those things as well, right? Massive malnutrition, masses, massive inability to have FDI in the very first place, as, and like massive unemployment as well. I'm not certain why you need to weigh out the resistance of drugs, which note is a key Western problem, for other problems that developing nations face, including the massive unemployment that leads to inability to buy basic services at all. Also, on their principle, I don't know why they spent so much of their principle on like so all of their PM on the principle. Like this is not a principle debate, and we can prove practical outcomes. Like it's contingent, very stock response, but it's important to know. On the political framework, why is it unlikely that the political changes that they want is likely to happen? First of all, because it's a political wash, right? Because if they rile up some populists that have a massive health crisis, they also have to rile up the farmers that want these antibiotics in the very first place. So you open up a new voting block that votes against have like votes against changing these standards at all, right? Note that the wealthy elites are oftentimes the ones that probably want these antibiotics the most given that they have control of any of these sectors. So it's likely that they have some lobbying power, or even if you don't buy that, the fact that like these farmers within these areas that are economically productive and probably have some sort of lobbying power is likely to go against the these regulations in the first place. So politically, it's likely to be a wash. Secondly though, even if you buy it on their best case scenario, it's still messed up, right? The fact is that the way that they get this political change is by creating such a massive health crisis that there's so much overcry that these people want to go out and do it. So I ask the question on whether or not it's okay to use these people as some sort of social battering ram in order for you to get this change at all. Third of all though, many of these nations that don't comply to these standards are, and like I don't want to overgeneralize here, but not ones with powerful political institutions, right? And not ones that can necessarily make long-term economic policies. That means that the populace are suddenly able to vote out immediately. Closing, I'll take you in a sec. Uh, I'll closing, I'll get something from you in a bit. The final kind of argument was there is likely to have more capital investment within these areas from other more sustainable practices. Notably, we told you the high startup costs for those type of pharmaceutical companies are unlikely to exist. Before I talk about our case, go ahead. There are 14 strands of tuberculosis. 13 of those are now resistant to all the drugs that are used to treat them because it's over prescription. If that is not the number one priority to, spread, to, to stop the spread of this disease that kills millions, then what is? Okay, so I asked the question of why it is that the developing nations are likely the one that have to take the brunt of that cost, right? Note that the antibiotics also have to deal with many other diseases as well. I'm uncertain as to why it is. So if you believe their principle though, they also have to give me a principle explanation on why you don't just ban these antibiotics writ large and ask that question as well. So in terms of our analysis, I think that the characterization I largely addressed, but it's really important to note here, right? Many of these countries are not what in which this healthcare infrastructure is able for them to regulate and if nothing else be able to prescribe and be able to watch over the hospitals in rural areas to make sure that these regulations are being met necessarily right key framing here is that oftentimes these people might use alternative drugs that aren't as safe but might also have these problems as well what else did we tell you that it was the fact that you were likely for these people to actually die the fact was that oftentimes these antibiotics are important for these individuals to have some sort of healthcare as well. But note, if nothing else, this is an imperialist thing, right? It is absolutely wrong for the WHO to use the populaces of these developing nations as some sort of way to get some sort of political change. The fact is that this is the largest impact in the round, that these people will die without these drugs, and they have no way out of it. Very proud to stand on open opposition. Thank you very much. Uh, let's call on the member of government.
so far has been deeply confusing because they wanted to tell us that a lot of things will go wrong. There'll be black markets, people will lose out on the access to drugs, there'll be, you know, economic devastation, the third world will just be a crater. But everything they've told you is contingent on this policy not being effectively enforced and us not solving two quite simple but distinct collective action problems. So what we're going to bring you is first explain the actual mechanisms for why those collective problems are fixed and secondly, tell you how this benefits agricultural practices in a significant way, and that will integrate with rebuttal to their claim of economic damage. But firstly, we just want to rebut the idea that this is not an actual problem or that there's no imperative to this policy. What we know is that there are 14 drugs that are capable of treating tuberculosis, a disease that every year kills millions of people in the developing world. And we thought that of those 14 drugs, we had four that were never used and they were a last line of resistance and if we ever got an outbreak, we could depend on those drugs. But what we found out in 2016 was that for years, China had been putting those drugs into the feedlots of pigs in that country. And as a result now, those, that tuberculosis is resistant to those drugs. We have no last line of defense. And if there is ever an outbreak of tuberculosis that is resistant to those drugs, people will die and there will be no way to help them. There will be no repercussions. There will be no way we can help them at all. That is the imperative for this debate. So firstly, what is the specifics of this collective action problem? What OO contend is that, oh, well, this occurs primarily in the developing world. Yes. Uh, sorry, developed world. Yes, but that is unclear why that would operate any differently. We tell you it is actually far more effective to combat this in the developed world. Most of the overuse does occur there. How specifically does it occur? We tell you that patients mistakenly believe antibiotics are panacea for a range of, uh, of illnesses that they cannot fix. And any time they get sick with things like colds, which cannot be treated with antibiotics, they then demand that of their doctors. Similarly, doctors now have incentives, even though they know these treatments will not work, to prescribe them for, to patients for the reason that one, they do not want to lose customers to other doctors, and two, they know patients will likely get those drugs elsewhere. Now, the easy solution to this problem would be for the government to regulate the sale of these drugs, but for all the reasons OO tells you, that does not currently occur. How does this problem get fixed in the developed world? We tell you, firstly, the first thing we do in this policy is provide specific information to people in these countries about where antibiotics are appropriate and what they can treat and when you should not seek them. So that is likely to reduce the demand on these drugs in the first place. Secondly, we apply to form standard across doctors. And note, all the problems with enforcement were in the developing world, so this was likely very easy to do in the developed world, where they identify most of the problem occurs. So we can just prevent doctors from prescribing these drugs when they shouldn't. And when that applies to all doctors uniformly, that means you're unlikely to get the problem where doctors prescribe these drugs in the fear that patients will go elsewhere, because there is no elsewhere. And 
why is it likely that governments would comply, which was their main contention, that Big Pharma has you know, performed regulatory capture? That is specifically why we need this policy, because there is no other way to get past that regulatory capture. But what this policy uniquely allows you to do is reframe the comparison in a way that governments no longer have, have the trade-off of take money from Big Pharma or not, but now it is, you know, crystallization of support across all strasses of society because the threat of losing access to antibiotics is very significant versus a small amount of money that may help in election campaigns. That suggests governments are quite likely to not want to piss off the huge range of people who probably will get very upset when they know they will never have access to antibiotics again. No, this is something enforced by the World Health Organization, so they would be the ones fighting companies and preventing them from selling drugs in the US, for example, or any other developed country. So it is not something the US government can prevent. Sure, oh, Okay, even in your best case scenario, pharma, pharma companies continue to create me too high resistant drugs. Doctors in the US continue to overprescribe because US pharma will always have massive lobbying power. If the drug resistance problem arose in countries unaffected by these two sanctions, how do you make any tangible impact on drug resistance? Well, we just told you that one, we stop the problem, and it occurs in the US too. That is just one example. In the developed world, we've explained how that is likely to happen, and now I'll explain how this impacts the developing world. Their main contention here for why this would not work in the developing world was just that you cannot enforce it. Three responses. First of all, there are some very easy fixes you can do immediately. That is things like you can require prescriptions to access antibiotics. That is very easy to implement, but is not done in the majority of the developing world. Secondly, you can do things like have databases of the use of the drugs. Thirdly, you can do things like have the World Health Organization do the enforcement of that and outsource it if the local government is incapable of it. And lastly, you can just provide information to people so they're less likely to seek out those types of drugs in the first place. Uh, but secondly, let's deal with agriculture because that is sort of the impact that is most likely to affect the third world. So the, the, the place where the antibiotic resistance actually develops. What we hear from OO is that no individual country will do this because they don't want to take the economic hit of losing uh, any of the money that they get out of this. But importantly note, when you apply this policy to all countries, there is actually no incentive for you to not do this because while it raises costs for you, it raises costs for your competition as well. So there is no loss of comparative advantage. And in fact, you are now able to charge higher prices and gain higher profit on those products because there is a scarcity of them. So it is actually uniquely beneficial to all the countries that have agriculturally based economies. So they're likely to want to buy in. But secondly, what we tell you is that this actually improves agricultural practices. Why? First question, why do we need these drugs? We tell you often the reason that we need these drugs in the first place is practices like factory farming, where they do things like put thousands of animals together in inhuman conditions, force feed them until their legs break, and then slaughter them. How is this problem? Why is this bad? Firstly, we tell you this is animal cruelty on a level that should be intolerable. Secondly, we tell you there are huge environmental impacts. One, in the deforestation necessary to produce these factory farms. Secondly, in the amount of methane and pollution released by these animals. And thirdly, in the amount of food that you must spend on feeding these animals to produce a luxury good that most people in those countries cannot afford and cannot access. And the opportunity cost is that food can then not be eaten by humans. How do we fix this? Firstly, with the removal of those drug practices, when you do not allow those to occur, it is now untenable to factory farm because of the diseases that would occur should you do that, which means that you are now required to do more sustainable practices because it is now impossible to factory farm. That is a couple of benefits. Firstly, you get rid of all the environmental harms we tell you. Secondly, it means there is a reduction in the amount of animal cruelty that occurs there. But thirdly, we tell you actually get a greater access to food in these countries because you do not waste huge amounts of food feeding animals when you could just give that food to people in those countries in themselves. So we drastically lower food prices in those areas and give people greater access to that. So proud to govern. Thanks very much. I'd like to welcome the member of opposition. Thank you.
think the debate so far has been incredibly uh, like two ships passing each other, right? It's like their side says, ah, countries will comply and therefore there's no problem. This side says companies won't comply, therefore you get all the harms. We're going to cover their best. That is to say, let's presume that some countries still comply. The problem with this is, however, there still exists a massive level of uncertainty to the extent of the time it takes to comply to a lot of these things, the long-term future of whether countries continue to comply with a lot of these things, and the existence of these markets. What we think this does then is does exactly what OG thinks is beneficial, which is change massively the incentive for pharmaceutical companies who have no incentive to mass produce the kinds of drugs that they can only make up the cost for if they massively sell these things. I think that creates the very sorts of harms they want to talk about in terms of access to the very same drugs. We think this massively makes it such that people can't afford these drugs going well beyond what we get out of this debate. Two things in the speech. Firstly, nuancing the kinds of uh, like kinds of regulations that exist and why we think certain like developing countries are unable to comply to certain kinds of regulations which we think is problematic. And secondly, in terms of pharmaceutical companies, how do we change their incentives and why is this massively problematic? The model at the end. Firstly, in terms of the kind of thing to comply, right? So what is uh, over talks about is the kind of regulation which is say, ah, you overprescribe medicine in general, right? People just take a lot of antibiotics in general. We think there are a couple of kinds of uh, like regulations which like developing countries are unable to prescribe and will be on our side of the house. The first is things like like uh, procedural regulations, right? Things like keeping massive amounts of records and the kinds of antibiotics that are prescribed in a lot of these things, which is incredibly hard to do in developing countries. Who have one, these are often like small scale clinics that are run by two or three people who can't afford to like give them the 15 seconds they have to deal with every single patient, also keep record of what antibiotics they're giving to these individual people and those kinds of things, right? It's also like government can't pump a lot of money into these particular clinics and do that because if they did, they would just build a big hospital in the first place, right? So it's no reason or it's no ability for these countries to comply to a lot of these things. But secondly, the fact that often these countries have incredibly small, like small, a, a huge shortage in terms of things like doctors and the medicines that exist means that they're forced to prescribe antibiotics for a lot of like uh, diseases that don't require antibiotics. And this is the way in which they like flout these regulations as OG wants to talk about, right? Things like, for example, you prescribe antibiotics for lots of medicines that probably don't require antibiotics but require lots of specialized medicine. It's just you can't afford those specialized medicines because the only way you can afford the kind of drugs that exist is they're mass produced to the extent that you can just sell them to everyone, right? Which is why, for example, in my home, my mom probably gives me the same kind of medicine if I have a headache or like a fever or a stomachache, right? Because you simply can't afford other kinds of drugs to the extent that it's cheap enough. Recognize that also, secondly, doctors just have too little time with patients to be able to specifically identify the specialized disease that they have and the kind of issues that they have. So even if doctors, for example, have the ability, like patients are able to afford these things, doctors simply can't have the amount of time that exists in order to do this. Which is why they give you an antibiotic and tell you that it makes it better. Obviously, this means that these diseases aren't solved in the extent that we want to, but the comparative on their side is people not getting any medicine at all, right? Recognize that the impact of this that OGO doesn't want to talk about is if they want to talk about outbreaks of like things like resistance, we talk about outbreaks of diseases themselves, which are significantly worse on their side of the house when at the point at which people have no access to medicines on their side of the house. But even if countries are able to do these regulations and actually pass these regulations, it's incredibly hard to implement these regulations in a lot of these countries, right? That is, governments find it incredibly hard to find and catch individual people and companies who are flouting these regulations because those people still have problems in incentives to massively sell these antibiotics. And recognize that on their side of the house, it's incredibly hard for the WHO to tell whether or not it's individuals flouting these regulations or governments being actively negligent in these kinds of things, which means that on their side of the house, regardless, countries are unable to comply, which means these countries are punished. This deals to a large extent with OG's principal idea of like these countries should be able to comply because often these countries are unable to comply in that matter. But let's take them at their best. That is to say these countries want to comply and these countries start to comply. The problem is, the margins on things like antibiotics for pharmaceutical companies is already razor thin in a way in which they sell to developing countries, right? The reason for this is you have to sell it cheap enough that people can actually afford these things because it has to be super, super cheap, but at the same time, you still want to make a profit, so you at best sell it like slightly above like the cheap cost of production in most of these cases, which means companies take like very small profits in a lot of these, in the way in which they sell to developing countries, right? But also in many cases for like, particularly for antibiotics, you often don't have patents for a lot of these things for individual companies, which means they're often like sold by many companies, so competition drives prices down, which means the profit margins are often smaller for antibiotics. The reason they sell it right now is because you can still make massive amount of profit because you have a huge market base in the developing world, which means you can still sell enough of these drugs and like reduce the cost of production enough that you still make profits. But also secondly, it's things like charity and like corporate social responsibility, which makes these companies look good in the developed world, which is why they continue to sell in the developing world. But lastly, because of the fact that the fact that you're selling to so many people means that price discrimination can happen to a much greater extent, which means you can still recuperate these costs in the developed world. Yeah. Even if we take 
government their best on their side of the house, which is to say countries start complying. This still one takes a lot of time to be able to do the massive amounts of regulations that they want these countries to impose, right? Because there are massive, large scale in, uh, like things that have to be done, but also like governments need to one pass these regulations and we talked about the top half clash on political. So even if they take that eventually these countries get these things happen, they take a lot of time. But secondly, even if they do have these regulations, pharmaceutical companies have massive amount of uncertainty whether one these regulations will continue to exist in these countries, for example, in years of like shortages and food security issues where countries might backslide on a lot of these things because it's unclear whether they will continue to do so at the expense of millions of people not getting food on their side of the house, but also to like newer governments coming in which might like radically like be much more populist and therefore go against these things, which means that people can afford these things. Why is this uncertainty harmful in and of itself? This uncertainty in the existence of these markets in the first place means pharmaceutical companies pull it away from the mass production of these drugs towards the developing world in and of itself. What does this mean? This does exactly what OG wants on their side of the house. You develop newer medicine that solves a lot of these issues. The problem is often it's massively expensive, which is the reason why they don't do it right now, and only people in the developed world can afford it because only they can afford specialized medicine for each individual issue, but also at the beginning, at the start of production, it's often super expensive because you make it super expensive at the beginning so to go play the cost opening. We told you that um, when companies have to pour large amounts of money into research and development because the disease mutates faster and faster, that's what makes the cost of production so inherently high. Uh, no, we think that, again, I think OG talks a lot about why like these, like, like mutations don't happen in the developing world, right? But also, secondly, like people will still keep buying into the developing world even if things happen, so you don't have these incentives that exist on your side. But what is the problem with developing these other kinds of medicine? It's literally the developing world can't afford these other kinds of medicine. You can only afford the antibiotics, and no longer when they no longer exist, and that the supply doesn't exist, you can literally not afford these things. Huge, importantly, why does this win us around regardless of compliance? Because one, this doesn't matter whether or not these countries comply. Mere uncertainty of the existence of this market right now and in the future means all countries are affected by pharmaceutical companies pivoting away from these things, which means you affect these countries. But also, secondly, you affect other developing countries that still comply or continue to comply in the status quo because the price of these drugs, even incrementally going higher, significantly affects developing countries more than it does pharmaceutical companies on their side of the house, which means all developing countries are affected a much larger impact in this debate. And lastly, on closing up, the first thing and only thing to point out is the US can still sell to itself, right? So it's unclear what change they're doing at all for the largest pharmaceutical industry in the world. For all of these people, are very proud of the folks. Thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to follow the last speaker on the left side, Douglas Pierre. Yes, we are, yeah. Yeah. This is it, yeah. The crown. I think one thing is very clear in this debate, that this is an emergency. This is a state that threatens the lives of billions of, billions of people around the world if we do not curb the spread of these diseases, if we do not stop uh, curb the spread of this overuse of these drugs. These drugs make, uh, make people immune, uh, make these diseases immune to the things that are meant to cure those diseases, and that is going to be the biggest humanitarian crisis the world faces if we do not arrest this. And that's where I think the off bench falls down today. There's nowhere in the three speeches that we heard any plan or any process by which to avert the objectively true crisis that the world is going to face. All of their responses have been uh, around how we can't enforce it, etc., but nothing about how they want to actually change the problem the world is facing, and that is why GovBench just has to win this debate. 
First thing I want to ask in the clarifying thing of WIP is where is this model occurring? Because this bizarre pushback we've had from all of our bench today has been that it can't occur in the West because there's political capture around Big Pharma and the West controls the World Health Organization. These are things that both benches have said, both teams have said. But it seems like they're firstly denying the government's ability in OG's uh, government's ability in today's debate to just fear in the motion to say we would apply a regulation to a, to a, a, a country and a body. I think that's, you know, it's fair for us to say that we as this body would implement this rule on our members. And that seems like what we can do in that way. And the thing too is, we do it all the time. See one, the info slide, which tells us we do it all the time. We haven't seen a flurry of members away from the World Health Organization as a consequence. They comply with that. But also see the way which it imposes things like safety regulations, it imposes testing regulations, it imposes things like, uh, 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 I mean, the process by which you have to prove your drug is safe and testable, etc. Imposes inspections frequently on these companies, and also, and probably well to this round, it imposes restrictions upon certain drugs that you have to apply for access to use and prescribe those drugs. All these mechanisms are ways which always exist the status quo that we could imply upon these companies to ensure they happen there. But second, the third response here is to say that all the interests of Big Pharma are to apply by these regulations because other member states will not buy drugs from companies that are actively flouting the rules of the World Health Organization. So Big Pharma has an incentive itself to, uh, uh, to uh, hear these regulations. And the governments from which these Big Pharma country, companies come also have an incentive to make sure that these companies are implying because of the huge economic benefits you get from the import-export value of the drugs in that economy there. So implants is likely to occur and will definitely occur in these countries. And that's why the the developing world was a bit strange and massively contradictory in their case, which I'll do with throughout my speech. But we can definitely apply it to the developed world, and that's definitely where it needs to happen most of all, because the huge rates of overprescription they refuse to engage with in today's debate. So the question we the next thing I want to ask then is that how do we help how does this model achieve its benefits without harming the population? Because their claim at OO was that we're gonna kill millions of people basically to ensure compliance, which was just ludicrous, right? Because we're not taking away drugs from people where these antibiotics work and where it is life threatening, we're taking it away from people who have a fucking cold and can't man or can't uh, you know, just cop it, you know? Like that's sort of where we need to be taking away these drugs from. And I think that's really important to, to differentiate here. We don't have to kill millions of people with the flu to stop people taking antibiotics for the flu. Just take the day off work and watch some Netflix, it will be okay. Or more importantly, work on your matter file. The second thing we say here, um is in the developing world then, by their own logic this can't work. Because there can't be a problem whereby there's limited access to these drugs, yet also there's a massive problem of taking away these drugs and killing millions of people. One of them has to be true, they can't decide which one they pick, therefore that argument must fall in the debate. But the last thing to say, even if all that's true, there's a far bigger harm coming if we don't take action, and they're the ones not taking action, and that's why we must do this model. They then want to say that what about the harms to the economy? Well, it won't be an economy if we're all dead. <laughs> so I think that's probably something to weigh up there. I know that was a bit facetious, but like obviously harms of people being more ill because the drugs we use to treat people uh, that aren't working anymore is a big economic harm. But secondly, this is a reason to reshape the economy in ways that are actually beneficial to that. And that's what Uday uniquely brings you around agricultural industries, and not just that they, you know, this is how we actually have to force the agricultural industries to change their practices so are better for animals and better for these drugs, but also force them to maybe do it less. And that helps the environment in many different ways. But also if the price of these uh, of meat rises, that's a good thing, because as delicious as KFC is, it's really bad for climate change, and it's really bad for the, for the, for the, for the global environment. And if we can push for more vegetables, I think that's a good outcome for all of us, uh, particularly the vegetable industry. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> what we're going to look at now then, it is, uh, actually I'll take a few white first. Can we tell you that the reason why these companies don't have these policies in the first place is that their economy literally depends on these policies to keep them viable and competitive. But most realistically, some countries might comply, some won't. All of our harms follow in these individual countries, but your benefits to drug resistance are contingent on unilateral control of high resistance drugs. Well, I think obviously our benefits are on, on, on doing these things, and that's why we want to do these things to make sure our benefits occur. But we can regulate these countries in a number of aspects in that way. Uh, so I think we can achieve those goals we, that you want, that we want to do in this debate. But in terms of ensuring compliance, this is what I want to go to now. I think where Uday's extension, I've just changed my order of the debate, but Uday's extension does a really good job here identifying how we fix these problems. We tell you uniquely about the fact that patients now just won't be able to ask for drugs that don't work, and that fixes the first problem. The second problem is that doctors can't just 
uh, we'll, can't just like prescribe it. Uh, doctors at the moment just prescribe it to, for fear of the doctor, for fear of patients going elsewhere. They can't do that anymore because there's nowhere else to go. And thirdly, the government can now apply those regulations. So Uday gives you material about how we fix those collective action problems. It goes unresponded to. Well, let's look at what CEO did say now and why we beat them. They want to go back to the lobby world again and saying we can't keep records. I think that's also a contradiction because in OO they claim that these, the, 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 these drugs don't exist in these countries here. So those two things are intention in the debate, which means they can't get up over each other. Well, it is right because they can't say you have so much use of these drugs that uh, these people are going to die. You can't also say there's no drugs there in the first place. Uh, secondly, we can also just restrict supply to these countries. And that's a very effective message of reducing that supply if we believe there's supply there in the first place. In terms of like record keeping, already the status quo, Medicine Sense Frontiers, the World Health Organizations do send in regulators, they do send in doctors, they do send in support networks. All these are mechanisms by which we can use to ensure compliance with this. But the third response to say is that like, even if it is not perfectly regulated in the developing world, that's okay because the biggest harms in the developed world, if we can knock out the majority of this problem that is like the massive additional benefit that we get on the outside that they do not. They say that doctors spend too little time with patients and it's far easier to describe this. That's the problem. We don't care if it takes you longer to see the doctor if you get the right medication and you don't have these harms occurring. We need to be saying to doctors, you can't just prescribe antibiotics for every claim that comes to you, otherwise you risk those harms there and that was an outcome there. The next thing that they want to talk about was about costs. I think that obviously the first thing to say is that most of these antibiotic drugs have not changed in decades. We've already recouped the production costs. They can chuck them out for like a cent. There's not much change there. But secondly, if those drugs cost higher. That is a good thing. That means people will buy them less. They will be prescribed less and reduce its overuse. Because importantly, those that need it the most are the ones that are most likely to get it either via government subsidy, via donations or aid, or, or, or via just like a, 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 like a subsidy program to the developed nations there. So the most people don't miss out on this because there are other ways to recoup that there. To the extent they lose a the market, what is it? Do they have a market there that's going to cost them millions if we get rid of this? Or is there no market there because those people don't receive those drugs? Those two things can't stand. This is the greatest economic uh, the humanitarian crisis is going to face the world. We have to do something about it, and that's why GOV has to win. Thanks very much.